Pixel Therapy is a member of the But Why Though Podcast Network. Go to butwhythopodcast.com for an inclusive geek community offering pop culture news, reviews, and podcasts. I love how grateful and kind and warm people are. I love being able to find new talents and people who haven't had a chance to be supported like larger influencers have. I love being able to offer opportunities and help people get discovered. And that's what I loved about being an editor too, was being able to give people a platform and a foundation to spring forth from. Welcome to Pixel Therapy, the video game podcast where we look at the games we play through the lens of the player, or what you play is just as important as how you play it, and where emotional intelligence is a critical stat. Every other week, we bring on a guest who may or may not consider themselves a gamer to discuss the games that have made them and changed them, and all the feelings they have about our favorite pastime. I'm your co-host, Jamie, pronouns she, her. And I'm your co-host, Spencer, pronouns they, them. And this is Pixel Therapy. As always, let's start with our Patreon name in the credits to your shout outs. This is our special thank you to all of our Patreon supporters who subscribed at the name in the credits tier for the month of October. So thank you. Thank you to Val, Genevieve, Lindsay, Grace, Jackie, Ben, and Cortland. Thank you all so much. (laughs) Thank you. We we really appreciate y'all. Uh, remember, if you, lovely listener, want to get your name in the credits, you should hop on over to patreon.com slash pixel therapy pod, where you can unlock monthly bonus episodes for just $2 a month or chip in a little extra to show your support and get a shout out in every episode. Of course, if you're a fan of us here on Pixel Therapy, there are lots of other ways to support the show, too, including sharing us with your friends and family and rating and reviewing us on Apple Podcasts, just like user It's Delights, who left us a lovely review titled, The Podcast That Made Me Rediscover What Gaming Can Do For Us. It's Delights writes, As someone who has been playing video games since they were only five, they were actually kind of a big part of who I was, until one day I sort of put down the controller and never picked it back up. It just Mm. sort of faded away as a hobby, I guess. Recently, I played a story-based AAA video game, just like the ones I mainly used to play, for the first time in years, and I remembered why I used to be a quote-unquote gamer. (gasps) I like the feeling of getting lost in something, but also having the control to decide exactly how to get lost in it. Mm. My partner has been playing a lot of video games. Nothing super crazy, but definitely more than he normally would. Today, he came to me and told me that he was struggling, and the reason he was playing so often was because it was something else to focus on that gave him an opportunity to stop ruminating on the things that were difficult. (gasps) Been there. (laughs) Partially because of this podcast and partially because of my own experiences, I was able to tell him I completely understood. (laughs) I love the insightful yet slightly controversial recurring question of, do you identify as a gamer to guess? Always prompts a reaction. I always find myself laughing with Spencer and Jamie. That's us. (laughs) I can hear their friendship through the speakers. (gasps) Oh, Aww. Apple Podcast users, it's delights. How dare you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much for that really generous review. Uh, I, I really just, appreciate that. I feel so seen. I love, I love that listening to this podcast made you feel like not only you could talk to your partner, but that you also understood like the emotional reasons behind why he was gaming. Mm-hmm. Like all of that. I just I'm yeah. like Let's get a drink. Let's get lunch. <laughs> <laughs> we'll bring you into the friendship circle. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thank you. Seriously. That made my yeah. day. Thank you so much. Um, remember, folks, if if any of you ever want to reach us with a question or a thought, um, you can drop a review just like It's Delights did, or you can send us an email at pixeltherapypod at gmail.com. Uh, we really do love hearing from all of you whenever you feel like reaching out. Mm-hmm. All right, Spencer, it's time. It's time to get cozy. It's time to pull up an armchair. Feel free to lie down on your couch. We're going to talk about our feelings. Spencer, how are you? Jamie, thanks for asking. <laughs> I'm well. I, uh, yeah? I'm, folks, I may have mentioned that I, at the last episode, I mentioned I adopted a dog. We adopted mm-hmm. a dog. Uh, his name is Odin. Today, we had our first on-site training uh, class. <laughs> he has a personal training class with a dog trainer named Maddie, who is just awesome. Um, her presence, as soon as she entered the, the 
the premises. It was like the air <laughs> changed. As soon as she walked up, he immediately looked at her and sat down as if it was just instinct, which was hilarious because we've been trying to teach him sit for the past three and a half weeks of owning him. Oh my God. <laughs> so he was just holding out on us. But uh, I don't know. I think, um, you know, working with a dog who's as anxious and scared and um, he, he's only two years old, but he spent most of his life either in the shelter or um, outside, not not with a family who loves him. And so um, he's learning a lot about life inside as well as <laughs> how to be a dog. Um, and we're just really trying to support him and increase his confidence. Um, it was actually like really fun to work with someone who's just so in tune with dogs and um, could tell it, gave us, was just showering us with awesome tips and tricks and, and things we can do to help him feel more at home and, and also engage him with us. And so basically, mm-hmm. I guess if anyone's an, a new anxious dog owner out there, uh, which actually is probably not that unheard of with COVID-19 <laughs> pet adoptions yeah. and the sharp increase, uh, I think adoptions, at least in the U.S., increased like 400% over the pandemic. Yeah. Um, but just really focusing on not trying to train too much, not punishing him at all, which we weren't doing to begin with because I'm a big softy. Um, but just doing <laughs> things like with his food, throwing it around kibble by kibble and turning it into a game so that he can explore the house or um, basically just throwing a treat at him whenever he does something we like, like looking at us or uh, coming over to us or leaving his crate where that the door is always open for. We're just like, yes, good boy. Yes. Treat. So um, that's what I did this morning. And, and it's really fun. Um, how are you, Jamie? <laughs> well, I'm just feeling a little jealous because I really wish someone would give me a treat every time I got out of bed. Um. Oh my God. We should des- also, I just feel like a game where you're training a dog and like throwing Ooh. treats and the mm-hmm. timing, like that could be a really interesting, um, yeah, like a really, let's develop that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do think, uh, yeah, really it, maybe, maybe all I'm looking for is like the last guardian, but like a game that like yeah. really teaches you how to train and like exist with an animal, I think would be an interesting, that'd be an interesting game. concept. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, no, I'm not doing too bad. Uh, I, yeah, I really can't complain. The weather uh, where we're at is really, really beautiful right now. It's that uh, we're in kind of like the the 60s during the day Ooh. and the sun is shining and you got that crisp fall kind of like mornings, but then it turns into like a nice, warm, beautiful day. And so wow. I've been spending a lot of time outside with the dogs, uh, which is wonderful. I live wonderful. two hours away and it's snowing, so... <laughs> really? You got snow already? <laughs> we got snow three times this week. <laughs> Holy cow, I did not know that. That's amazing. But it's amazing. not sticking. Thank, yeah, but still. Thank dog. Still. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's, uh, yeah, it's been in the 60s here for the most part this week. Um, it like, But like dropping down to like 30 at night and mm. in the morning, so you get that like frosties on the on the gra- on the grass in the morning mm-hmm. which our puppy is it's really funny he does not like the frost so convincing him that oh. he should go out into the yard and go to the yeah. bathroom in the morning is he he was uh he came up from the south so he like lived the first few months of his life like in a very warm climate outside a lot <laughs> yeah. and like he's come up here and like you can tell he's just like what the actual fuck please send me back to the land of the sun <laughs> this frozen hell you brought me to <laughs> it's like you know the sun sets at 4 p.m and yeah. <laughs> it's funny uh, when we first got him his hair was very thin because he spent so mm. much time outside in the in the warm weather we got him in august and over the last couple of months his hair has had to get a lot thicker he had a, used to have a very mm. like naked belly and now he's got all this hair on his belly <laughs> It's he's a, like, I yeah, have it's... to evolve just to survive here. <laughs> yeah, basically, basically. <laughs> Y'all I'm, just like always, this? <laughs> I'm just always found that really interesting that they can just do that. That mm-hmm. they just like their bodies are like, oh, you're cold. Here, have some more hair. Like absolutely know, nature, right? Dog skills. Um, but yeah, this is now a dog podcast. Um, <laughs> we'll be exclusively talking about dogs. No, just kidding. We're going to talk about video games. <laughs> Spencer, what are you playing? Oh my gosh, Jamie, what are we playing? What in the, what are we playing? Okay, what so this are is we game. Playing? Y'all, this, this is game. game. It's mm-hmm. called Inscription mm-hmm. with, with a, a Y. y. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> Which doesn't make any sense to just say. Yeah. It makes it inherently spookier. It's like a it does make it spe- no. script. Yeah. But uh, essentially, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. this game just came out uh, mid end of October um, or mid October for PC and Mac. 
developed by Dan Mullins Games and published by Devolver Digital. Mm -hmm. And Inscription is a card game. Why don't I just read you a little bit of the Steam Store description? (laughs) Um, (laughs) Yeah, I do like that Steam Store description. Inscription is an inky black card-based odyssey that blends the deck-building roguelike escape room style puzzles and psychological (laughs) horror into a blood laced smoothie Mm. darker still are the secrets inscribed upon upon the cards dot 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 okay so inscription was also just recently nominated uh for two game awards categories which is basically like the what is what is, the the VMAs of the game world? Yeah, I don't know. There, <laughs> some people like to say it's the Oscar. It's it's the Oscars in the sense that it's the most famous of the video game award shows, but it's all voted on by uh, games media rather than game developers or anyone like we're actually working on games. Hmm. So it doesn't. I, I don't know. It's it's more of a hype show and a media show than uh than like real game dev uh game devs like saying lifting up like these are the creators that we want to celebrate this year yeah. so it's a, it's a fun show i don't want to uh downplay it and they definitely they always have like awesome trailer releases and stuff at the show but yeah i'd say it's it's not directly comparable to the oscars because it it doesn't have quite that same level of prestige yeah and you sometimes wonder uh, the games that get nommed it's often i think skews towards triple a which you know Mm -hmm. we're kind of speaking towards the types of studios that have the funding and the uh you know brand recognition to kind of be seen as a uh i don't know like a big player in the space like those are the ones that are often getting the the wreck the wreck yeah (laughs) but when you really think about what makes a great game and who's out here doing really big genre pushing rethinking kind of pushing the boundaries and like the folks that we really feel like are are bringing the medium forward i don't know if that's always captured just yeah. just me being super salty that chicory was totally <laughs> snubbed this year um but um no I, yeah i just think you know there's a grain of salt like with a lot of things but um mm-hmm. but also we are happy to share that inscription was nominated for two awards, which very well deserved, if I may say. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> best indie game <laughs> as well as best sim or strategy game. Um, and yeah, so Jamie, why don't why don't I pass it over to you? Why don't you tell us a bit about how your first impressions of inscription have have been? Sure. So. Uh, as, as Spencer uh, read there from the Steam description, it, inscription is on its face a roguelike deck building card game. If you have any uh, familiarity with what that is, it, essentially, so let's let's take those pieces uh, one at a time, right? Roguelike meaning uh, you you play until you die or fail, and then you restart over again at the beginning. Deck building the entire game is played out with cards. Uh, like Yu-Gi-Oh. <laughs> <laughs> this, I think this is, a, I'm not super familiar with Yu-Gi-Oh, but I do think this is a far cry from <laughs> Yu-Gi-Oh. Um, in, in, uh, in this game, the aesthetic is immediately what I think captures you as you're playing this game. The cards themselves that you're, that you're playing with, that you see on the screen, uh, you're, it's kind of got this first person perspective where you can see uh, your hand of cards that feel like they're being held in your hands. All the cards feel like they're kind of hand drawn mm-hmm. um, in this really uh, simple, but evocative sketch style. The cards mostly have an- different animals on them. There's predators and there's uh, squirrels for the most part, it's kind of like the two categories of what you fall into. And the squirrels are essentially... Prey. Yeah, the squirrels are used as sacrificial prey. Um, every card that you have has both a, a level of health and a level of power, and the power is like the damage that they do to the other side. And your what's what's really cool in Inscription is that you are sitting across this, this big wooden table in a mostly dark room, and all you can really see of your opponent are their creepy eyes creepy. that go all swirly when they talk to you. And they, the sound that the game makes as the creature is talking is very, very scary. It's like just this like blah, 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 blah. Like a dark, uh, like rumbling static. 
Yeah, yeah, that's a great way to put it. Uh, as the creature speaks and the and the text of what it's saying appears on the screen, almost as though it's not speaking with real words, but you're kind of like, it's almost like you're hearing it in your head. Mm. So immediately, like that entire scene that the game sets around the card game is both incredibly like important to the game and also what makes the game so cool. Like you feel like you're in this dark, uh, you start to realize eventually that it's a cabin, this dark cabin in the middle of the woods, playing this creepy entity um, in a game for your life Mm -hmm. uh, is what the game sets up. And so as you play, the the card game itself is, I think, deceptively simple. Mm -hmm. It feels more complex than it is. And I think as you play it, you, you quick, like, it has a complexity to it that rolls itself out, but the actual basic mechanics of it are quite straightforward, which is that you have two decks that you draw from it that you can draw from at the start of your turn. One deck has squirrels in it, the other deck has your your most again, mostly predators in it that you can play. You can only draw one card at the start of each turn, but you need squirrels and other things on the board in order to be able to sacrifice them so that you can play the more powerful predator cards. So essentially the way a turn would work is you'd get your initial hand. There would always be at least, there would always be one squirrel in your hand. Squirrels don't cost anything to play on the board, but they also have no power. They're one health and no power. So you can play a squirrel and then all of your other predators require a blood sacrifice. And depending on the power of the predator, they require a different uh, amount of blood to be sacrificed. So some Creatures may only require one blood, which means you can kill one squirrel and then you can play that creature. Some creatures might require two, three, even four blood, which means you either need to, uh, over several turns, amass more squirrels on the board, or as the game unfolds, you might be able to uh, decide to sacrifice other creatures that you have on the board that were doing damage in order to play a higher level card or... Um, eventually there are cards like a a black goat card comes into the game that is worth three blood when you sacrifice Mm -hmm. it. So the game slowly builds on these mechanics. I think the tutorializing of the game, I really appreciated from the outset. Like I think Mm -hmm. it's, they make it super clear how this game works and how you're going to interact with it. And the game really teaches you things in a really straightforward way. It doesn't belabor anything. It doesn't spend too long on it. And and it walks you through it and you're engaged because everything's got this like creepy atmosphere. Um, but essentially you're trying to do five points more damage to the other side than they do to you. And you go back and forth with this guy. Mm-hmm. Um, it is very creepy because the way the points, again, the aesthetic of this game, so powerful. The points are are played out on these scales. And as you gain points, the uh, the creepy figure across from you in the table is actually putting teeth <laughs> on mm-hmm. the scales that are weighing them down. So if you get five teeth more than he's got, then you'll you'll beat the hand. And then as you win your first game, he unfolds a map in front of you, and you realize essentially you're he's telling you this story of a character who is lost in the woods, a traveler who's lost in the woods, and saying that this was you. You were lost in the woods, and this was how you came through this path. And you you pick paths on this map that he's laid out in front of you, and these lead to other things. So a lot of the things that you encounter are card battles with him, but he's also telling you this complicated story. So there's, uh, in the woods, you might find a group of starving uh, tribesmen around a fire, and they say, come forward, come to the fire, and, and place your <laughs> place your place one of your creatures on the fire, and it'll make it stronger. But the game says that they're drooling and hungry, and so there's this <laughs> risk-reward factor of like, do I put my creature on the fire? Do I not? Are they going to eat it? Um, you can also encounter an, an old woman who carves totems, and if you get a totem from her, that might put special abilities on some of your cards. Um, there's this creepy scientist who has two heads and he'll take two of your duplicate cards and merge them together. And you can, you work through this, these events, you go through these different maps and that's, that's like kind of the roguelike. So as soon as you've lost twice to the character sitting across from you at the end of the table, the game essentially ends and you're reset back to the beginning. I do want to add one of the aspects to the roguelike part two that I appreciated in that sense was like every time you play, even though you're starting from the beginning, you could be taking a different path and you Mm -hmm. also will be building a different deck. Like it's never like you're playing with the same cards each time because the process of the journey, uh, you, you 
empower and combine and sacrifice and and grow in different ways, which I thought was, made it kind of like Hades in that you have a different build each time you're trying to run. Yes. Yep. 100%. That's a great uh, added point because that, that is the deck building aspect of it. So that's essentially how a roguelike, I mean, that's the gist of how a roguelike deck builder works. That's the gist of how inscription works. What is so incredible about inscription, there's both that aesthetic thing that I've already mentioned and just the the animation of the game, the art design of the game, the style of the game, the the creepy narrative that's being laid out in front of you, the way the way you're sitting in a location with this character that you're playing cards with and he's telling you a story that you're participating in. Like it's like already, so you're already setting up that it's kind of a game within a game, mm-hmm. right? But what you realize, I think pretty early on, is that you can actually stand up from the table where you're playing cards with this creepy character and you can move around the cabin. And as you move around the cabin, you start to encounter escape room puzzles. <laughs> <laughs> and you start to realize that there might be a way to get out of this cabin and mm-hmm. out of this roguelike game that you're playing with this creepy figure. And I think it's that aspect and kind of the the things that you begin to discover after everything that comes after that point of realizing you can stand up from the table. And as you start to solve the puzzles and as you start to figure out how you're going to get out of this cabin, the game turns into what I can only describe as like a Russian nesting doll of a game where you mm. just keep feeling like you're pulling back layers on an onion and finding the next layer deep. And it's all, it all feels like a game within a game within a game within a game. And it's mind blowing. Just from a game design perspective, I don't, I don't know how else to describe it. Like, the mm-hmm. way this game folds in on itself and steadily reveals to you the depth that it has uh, consistently is mind blowing. Yeah. Whatever you think the game is about, you're wrong. Unless you spoiled yourself, which please don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Don't spoil yourself. What, uh, what did I not capture there though? What, what were your initial impressions of the game? No, I, I absolutely agree with everything you're saying. Um, Another way that this game uh, describes itself is as a mind-melting, self-destructing love letter to video games. And I think that that Mm. absolutely (laughs) is felt. Um, I think there's this, you know, Jamie mentioned that you start out in a cabin. You don't know why you're there. It's dark. It's candlelit. Behind a locked door, you see a white light flashing. And you have no idea what that is. And around you is also, um, you know, there's sculptures of animals and heavy bound books and weaponry. There's a safe. Um, there's, um, you know, and, and the aesthetic of it is, um, you know, everything's rendered in 3D um, and everything has this cohesive, you know, kind of atmospheric, dark demonic (laughs) vibe (laughs) um but it also isn't necessarily like overly processed like there's almost kind of like this vintage almost like a 90s computer game kind of feel to it um Mm -hmm. like it feels almost nostalgic um something really interesting by the way this is just an aside but when I, i i did finish the game this morning before we recorded and um in the credits i noticed that it got to this section where it said um creative commons like open source 3d assets and pretty much like everything in the cabin um the game developers pulled from like open source 3d artists so like candlestick uh pliers safe uh like picture frame like and there were like Hmm. hundreds of them and i was like wow it's like you know i I think it just speaks to the nature of video game creation that you can take pieces that maybe you maybe these items feel nostalgic because maybe i saw them somewhere else but you can put them Mm. together in a new way that feels that is absolutely unique um and something that is so much greater than uh you know its individual parts um like i I just thought that that was so 
interesting because this game is incredible and it, and it absolutely is one of the best games I've played this year. And every time I, like, I can't stop thinking about it. It's just a card game. Like when Jamie was like, mm-hmm. you should play Inscription. It's a card game. I was like, what the? I played Gwent, okay? I was not, <laughs> was not, for folks who may not know, Gwent is the card game within the universe of The Witcher. Um, so <laughs> The Witcher 3 came out, which is like a high fantasy game by CD Projekt Red, who also made Cyberpunk 2077. I have a lot of personal uh <laughs> the witcher's not my favorite game but i really did like when um but again i was like okay i know what to expect from a video game card game like why uh-huh. and it's just uh it it opens onto itself and mm-hmm. uh it's it's a it's the game but it's also the feelings it evoked and the that that mystery of um, like, I feel like as a child, when I played games, I I think back in the age of cheat codes and sort of this idea that you can play a game and have an experience with it. But if you know who to talk to, or you know, the history of the game or, or you look into like who made it um, there, there were more secrets you could kind of uncover and you could kind of create a new experience with the game. And I feel like that's largely lost with contemporary gaming because so much of it has been, um, you know, sort of consolidated. And I think game creators are not creators, but game publishers, <laughs> uh, and game like, like the Microsofts of the world are so much more interested in making sure that, that, um, any enjoyment is paid for and that uh, any extra Mm. things you get from the game that they're being compensated for things are behind paywalls. Like I just feel like the kinds of cheat codes that I'm used to playing with, it's just not as much of a thing these days. Like you can't just buy some thing you can plug into your handheld and download all of these (laughs) codes. And like, uh, but this made me feel like the game was alive in a way Mm, or, mm -hmm. or it was, it was still being, there's still more beyond the credits and it's just waiting mm-hmm. for that to be uncovered. Um, mm-hmm. that really made this special. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah, no, uh, 100%. And I, something I forgot to mention too, that, that happens pretty early, early in the game that I think, uh, starts to help draw you in is, uh, that some of the cards begin to speak to you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the <laughs> way that the way that happens, the things they're saying, the mystery that that unfolds. I mean, I, yeah, I think I think you nailed it, Spencer. Just just talking about the the way this game it feels like you can break through it mm-hmm. in some way. And the game is both enticing you to do it and wants you to do it. And as you start to discover that that is necessary, <laughs> like mm-hmm. that that's actually part of the gameplay is just genius. Mm-hmm. Like the game is like tempting you to not just take this on its face as a yes. s- straightforward card uh, you know, deck building roguelike card game. Like you can just play the card game and get enjoyment out of the game, but it is constantly going, what's, what's that over there? Mm -hmm. What's that? What's that behind you? Mm -hmm. What's this, what's this have to do with something? What if you just, and and it rewards you. Like every time you, you experiment or you say, I wonder if this will work this way, or if I could try to do this, you get rewarded. Mm -hmm. Um, every time you lean into exploring that mystery. Mm. So, those are our initial impressions of inscription. Uh, folks should go play this game. If, uh, if you have a PC, you can play. I do think that the attention this game is getting, I could definitely see this getting announced coming to consoles um, or, or, or wider release uh, in the near future. So if you don't have a PC, if you can't play this now, uh, there I, I think there's hope like i do think this is going to come <laughs> to more places yeah um because it's gotten so much attention but but we'll see you know i could i could certainly be wrong about that um but i do think that part of talking about this game especially as two people who have finished it we also do want to dive into some deeper spoilers and i don't think we necessarily want to spoil the entire story but we're going to start to talk about things that i think if you haven't played the game at all and you have any interest in playing this game i think you should go play it uh, and then come back and listen to this portion of the episode. So this mm-hmm. is your warning. Here be spoilers. We're going to be getting into it a bit. I don't think we're going to go super deep into spoilers, but enough. So like, if you want to go into this game cold, which I think you should, then go now. All right. Mm-hmm. Okay. Who's left? 
Have you all played Inscription or you're just not going to play Inscription at all? You should probably play Inscription. Hey, what's wrong with uh, you? Get out of here. Yeah. Go on. Get. You should go play Inscription. Um, so yeah, speaking from the assumption that folks who are still listening have played it, you eventually can break out of the cabin. Yeah. <laughs> and I certainly thought that was going to be the end of the game. Same. And it wasn't. <laughs> uh, you realize that that is just the end of the first act of a three-act game. Mm -hmm. Not me thinking, oh, okay, it's been about ten hours. I must be nearing the end of this charming indie card game. Yeah. I just defeated the moon. What could possibly be next? <laughs> yeah, so how did, how did you feel when you defeat the moon you unlock what you unlock videos from a real life person, Luke Carter, who mm -hmm. has been who has found who found the original inscription cards, mm -hmm. who found the game. Yeah, and, essentially this YouTuber, uh, this person who um, is really into collecting different cards from various card games and kind of, you know, does unboxings and talks to his followers about like where they can find and collect these things. Um, and you know the you know you're, you you just you've been in this cabin for if, if you're me ten hours and suddenly <laughs> you know the screen starts glitching. Uh, it's very like Doki Doki Literature Club if anyone's played that particular visual novel. Um, but essentially, you realize that you are not you. You are playing this game through the eyes of a person who is um, who has found. Uh, this disc, essentially, this floppy disc that has the game on it and is recording his screen of himself playing the game. Um, mm -hmm. I think what was what was fascinating was uh, in the in the first act of the game, when you're in the cabin, you know, playing against this mysterious figure, um, there's a there's like a moment where something really wild happens. Um, essentially, like there are items that come into play as you're playing the card game and in the pursuit of balancing the scale, you know, not letting it tip too far full of teeth uh, towards your opponent's end and therefore spelling your doom, um, you can do things like use a pair of pliers to pull one of your teeth out and rebalance the scale. Or eventually you find a knife in the cabin and you can use that to cut out your own eye and place that on the scale. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a moment where you hear a voice who isn't your opponent and is definitely not you that says like, oh shit. And I remember that the moment that I like look around and I was like, was that I'm playing this at like 1 a.m. in the dark? Um, <laughs> You're like turning around and somebody behind me. <laughs> yeah, like what? And 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 I think that's when I first started having this inkling of like, okay, what the f is going on here? But then like a few more hours pass before you realize, like Jamie said, um, the game backs you out. You're kind of looking at someone's hard drive full of videos, and as you click around, you realize um, that this this content creator has stumbled upon these cards. Um, as he's opening a card pack for one of his videos, one of the cards has a uh, mysterious coordinates written on them. He goes mm -hmm. to the location, digs up a box that has a floppy disk of inscription on it, goes back home, starts playing the game. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I think just the very jarring, I was not at all expecting to see literally a, a real person, like an actor, mm -hmm. like talking. And mm -hmm. um, I could immediately just all my assumptions about what I was playing just immediately blew up in smoke. And I was like, what is going on? Um, <laughs> even yeah. then I thought like, oh, okay, this is like some kind of horror cabin in the woods. Like, oh, he found this game and now he must be like stuck in some kind of demonic horror story. Uh, but it's not even that. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, yeah, so, so they, they bring you into this next section of, of the game, right? So you, you watch yes. those videos, you understand, like, the meta narrative of, of what's happening, and then you get brought into the next section of the game, which is, like, a traditional RPG with card mechanics? Mm -hmm. Like, Pokemon-esque, yeah. almost. Um, and, and you get told, uh, introduced to this kind of story of the four scribes. So, so you know, while you're in your cabin, the cabin, I mentioned some of the cards are talking to you. Um, you realize that those were those are actually three of the scribes. The fourth scribe is the one that you've been playing against, and that these four scribes they all had different ways of capturing the world around them. Uh, uh, the one that you were playing the game against, he used his camera to take pictures of nature, and uh, there's 
Uh, there's one who is the scribe of death, uh, Grimora. She uh, she accounts for things as they die. And there's a scribe that paints. And there's this, uh, the fourth scribe is a robot uh, computer, mm-hmm. essentially. Um, and the way they characterize each of these characters, I think, is is really awesome. Because I also kind of felt like they were... Uh, yeah, I, I'm curious to hear what your take on the scribes is because I think that the meta narrative around the scribes could be read as they are either game developers or game players or maybe both. Mm. Um, mm. You know, L- Leshy, the the one who takes photos, he's very interested in lore and narrative and in telling a story mm. around the gameplay. And Grimora's the goddess of death. Like all she cares about is your, you know, your kill count, racking up the bodies. Uh, PO3, the robot is like min max. All he cares about is like maxing out stats and Mm. cutting away all the frills, like telling a very straightforward and, you know, not even a story. It's just about the, the numbers of the game and uh, Magnificus, the painter is it's all about the art and the gravitas. Right. I I don't know. Mm. I thought that was, there was like something interesting to be told there about like what, where the, each of their focuses were. Yeah. And then what, what you, what you realize is that the four of them are essentially vying for power over the game itself and how the game is told. So uh, initially you were in Leshy's game and Leshy had uh, trapped the other three scribes inside of the game so that he could totally control the game. But it, it alludes to the fact that once upon a time, they were all four in existence and there was some balance, right? Mm-hmm. And I, I could see that as being a sense that like all four of those things need to ex- like should exist in a game to make a game whole. Mm. And that for any one of them to take complete power, because uh, the, the the game, the card game that you're playing with Leshy, like it's very easy to break it. Right. Um, it's very easy to create an overpowered deck mm-hmm. and completely run the board um, because that's not I think I think that that. That is the reason I think the reason that is, is because that's not what he's invested in. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I did, well, you're just you- blowing my mind right now. I feel like <laughs> it's all coming together. I'm like that meme of like uh, uh, Jessica Lange or whoever with all the math in front of her face. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, so I for, for me, I thought that was really interesting because then, you know, as you as you play through the second act of the game, you you learn that PO3, the robot is is trying to make a power play for him to totally take control of everything and, and run the game. And then when mm-hmm. you get to the third act, he does do that. And you have to play PO three's version of the game, uh, which I personally find to be way less engaging than, mm-hmm. than, than Leshy's version. Right. But I'm someone who cares a lot more about narrative and lore and world building yes. than I care about min maxing and having like a really strategic, strategic like, bare bones thing. Right. Yeah. So I, I don't know. I just thought that was really interesting. I, I think it sets up this really interesting meta narrative, the way those four things are competing. Like are those four things competing within the game developer? Is that competition within a dev team and the way people prioritize different things? Cause they're constantly like, fighting with each other and trying to take yes. control of the world and, and, and by such take control of the game and be the only one who's. Uh, uh, yeah. Well, see, I think what's fascinating there is first of all, mine's still blown. Jamie, you need to go, crit- go be a game critic because Holy F you just broke my mind wide open. And I, I I'm hate, just I like more, so much is rushing around and I need to go play this game again from the beginning. But I think that, like you said, those four, you know, states of being or ways of creating, I think they can exist within each one of us or within a team or within a game developer. And they did for a long time, but there was something within this disc that an evil latent within it that has corrupted the game and turned them against Mm -hmm. each other and forced them into this constant struggle for dominance. And so I think one more thing I wanted to mention about the game was just the fact that in addition to what's going on in the game itself, um, there were essentially these, these codes within the game that you can see, I believe in the first act, you have an opportunity to, to see it like come across the screen. And so in addition to like, after the game was released, there was an ARG, uh, a augmented reality game or artificial reality game, where essentially like people within the game's Discord, like, like the community around the game uh, that was mm-hmm. discussing it on forums outside of the game, they were 
code breaking and investigating and putting clues together and figuring out outside of the game <laughs> what was going on in the rest of the game's lore. And it was mm-hmm. just um, this week that uh, the group of people who were actually investigating figured out, cracked the code, and sort of were able to fill in the remaining gaps around the game's lore. And I just think that the fact that literally understanding the game truly did escape the confines of the game and melt it into the real world mm-hmm. just ties right back in into the whole like, narrative of this game and makes it that much more of a mind fuck. Yeah. Yeah, I feel like it's it's uh, this the meta narrative that has been created or- uh, around the game, within the game, through the game, outside of the game, like this, <laughs> all of this aspect of it is so cool and so interesting. And I feel like it's it's not just trying to be a cool experience; it's trying to say something about game development and game playing, and how all of those things are so completely intertwined with each other. I mean, just the fact that like part of the game exists outside of the game. Mm -hmm. Like as players, like our interaction with the game is a crucial part of the game playing experience. I just, I find all of that super fascinating. And it's one of the things like that aspect of it alone almost has this at the top of like my best game I've played this year. Mm -hmm. That said, the actual experience of Mm -hmm. playing the second and third acts of this game, unfortunately kind of sucks. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Like, like it's 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 because not bad. It's not <laughs> yeah. bad. Yeah, yeah. But compared to the art direction of the first act, mm-hmm. the to- the whole ambiance of the first act, the way the escape room puzzles are actually important to solve to make your way out of the room, the way all of that feeds into each other, chef's kiss. masterful, masterful. The game would not. That that game alone, if it was just the first act of the game, it would be amazing. Mm-hmm. It would not be the mind fuck, my mind is blown <laughs> experience that the entire game is, mm-hmm. but also the gameplay of the second and third acts. I, they just, they fell short for me, mm-hmm. especially the second act. I think coming out of the first act and going into the second act, which is a uh, pixelated like I said, like traditional, it almost reminds me of Pokemon or mm. Mario, old school Mario. Like you're kind of moving around on a map and you're having like these Undertale. car battles. <laughs> Undertale. Yeah. Um, that experience, jarring. So mm. jarring. And I remember messaging with you even when, when mm. you got to that point and you were kind of like not wanting to keep going. Yes. I was <laughs> challenged. Like, yeah, it's just, I think too, because I spent so much time, like I think it's both one of the, one of the things that's really unique and fascinating about this game, but also one of the things that I personally found quite frustrating was just that I thought I was starting to understand what I was getting into. And then that rug was pulled out from under me, but also like you said, like, I think it was just the, I was spoiled by, I think, I think maybe you and I both are people who are generally very, we are the, we are that scribe that once is driven mm-hmm. by the more narrative world building. That's driven by the lore, driven by feeling and, you know, this idea that there's so much more going on. There's so much to sink into and, and also just getting caught up in, in the minutia of like everything around me and the way it all was working mm-hmm. together. And so when I was thrust out of that into someone else's version of what they thought the ideal game experience would be, because that's literally what's happening within the game, um, Mm -hmm. I wasn't into it. And so I I I think that it like speaks to kind of like what these characters are representing and why their versions of the game didn't resonate as much. And also, I completely agree with you that, you know, it you know, maybe was the game trying to do too much by the end? Was there so much happening that it became a little bit difficult to pull it all together? Maybe. Um, Yeah. I don't like, I, I think I'm, I'm personally in this space of like still figuring out, like, did I not like it because it truly wasn't as, uh, I don't know. I don't know if high quality is the word, but it, it wasn't as, rich and structured as the first act of the game is that what it was or was it that i was just frustrated because it wasn't the type of game that i am interested in playing 
Yeah, no, I think that's completely valid. And I think, um, I think for me, it's more the, the latter, like, Mm -hmm. I don't think that the second and third acts are like, I don't think they're bad games. And I also don't think that inscription is, is what it is and tells the story that it wants to tell without those acts. I think they're Mm -hmm. very necessary. Um, I, I was reading a review earlier this week where someone was arguing that like, maybe the game should have just ended after the first act and didn't need the second and third acts. And, as much what? as I didn't appreciate the gameplay of the second and third acts as much, I think that our, like any argument that says that it should have just been the first act, like has completely missed the point of the game. Yes. Yes. Um, <laughs> not to like uh, fire shots at that reporter, but, or that critic. Um, but it was, it certainly wasn't as fun to play. And mm-hmm. it, it wasn't like what was pulling me through at that point was the meta narrative and, mm-hmm. and wanting to see what was going to happen with Luke Carter and wanting to see what was going to happen between the scribes. But I mean, I, I found myself, you know, as I'm working my way through PO 3s uh, game, which is almost set up like a souls like roguelike mm-hmm. um, where, you know, if you lose, you go back to a checkpoint, a specific checkpoint, uh, and you have to go back to get your resources kind of a thing <laughs> and, and all of the stuff with the circuitry and, and his and the way I don't, I don't know. It's just, it's not as engaged. It wasn't no. as engaging to me personally. I almost found myself nostalgic for Leshy's game. Yeah. Leshy being uh Leshy's the name of the, the character that you fight in or that you play against in the cabin. And uh I, <laughs> I, I kind of by the end of the game, like in the beginning, Leshy is the bad guy. And as as you play the game mm-hmm. and PO3 is kind of revealed to be the ultimate villain um, of the game, I really wanted to go back and just play with yeah. Leshy. Like I was very nostalgic for Leshy. And I think the way uh, as the game ends and you get to play a game with each of the scribes and you get to see what Grimora, the scribe of death's game would look like. And you get mm-hmm. to see what Magnificus, is, the, the scribe of... Um, Actually, I'm not, I don't remember exactly what they say he's the scribe of. Do you remember? No, I was trying he's to... He's, like, yeah. set up as, like, magic and art it, yeah. and painting. And wasn't he, like, but their I, leader at one point? I don't know. He seemed... I yeah. think so. I don't, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, you get you get to play a game with him, and I'm like, mm-hmm. I want to play those games, too. Yeah. Like, I want to... I would... I want to play their games. Um I, yeah, I don't know. I think uh, the fact that, you know, Daniel Mullen's games, there were a lot of f- folks that contributed to pieces of this game, but Daniel Mullen's games is really just Daniel Mullen's um, from what I've read. So just this is like the way I, I think it's it's a story about how the these things compete out mm-hmm. with us and like what we're looking for in games. And just that as a meta narrative, it's really quite the achievement. Mm hmm. Y'all, everyone should just go play Inscription. <laughs> yeah, well, hopefully if you haven't played it, you're no longer listening because yeah. we maybe just spoiled the game for you. But but also, I feel like if I... I tend to be someone who's not very spoiler-averse, so I feel like if I had heard this conversation and I hadn't played the game, but I didn't think I was going to play the game, I would now want to go play the game. Yeah. So I don't know. Maybe you did stick around and listen to spoilers, even though you haven't played, um, and hopefully you this monster. makes you want to go check it out. <laughs> monster you animal <laughs> go play it it's an awesome right. game all right uh we're gonna go ahead and transition into our interview for y'all today we got another special one today we're in conversation with aiden strahan aiden came up as a freelancer games journalist and editor doing work at several gaming sites before making a bit of a pivot and landing at ubisoft where they work as a creator relations pr specialist uh, in direct contact with influencers and creators offering them support and access to ubisoft games and projects we had an insightful conversation with aiden about the importance of trauma-informed reporting and how both journalists and trauma survivors need more support when reporting news on these topics we also chat about finding queer community through gender expression the power of choice both in games and as a means to recovery and the prolific Vocaloid software voice bank that is Hatsune Miku. (laughs) Uh, Spencer and I really appreciated all that Aiden had to share with us, and I'm sure that you all will too. Without further ado, here's our interview with Aiden Strahan. Hello to our wonderful guests, and thank you so much for joining us in the virtual pixel therapy studio. To start, could you share your name, pronouns, and just a little bit about how you spend your time? 
Absolutely. My name is Aiden Strahan, and I use they, them pronouns. Uh, And gosh, my latest hobby uh, is dressing up with my friends in very frilly, obnoxious dresses Mm. in a Japanese alternative fashion called Elegant Gothic Lolita. Oh my gosh. Can you tell us more about Elegant Goth Lolita and just uh, like paint us a picture of the aesthetic? Uh, Absolutely. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, It's like, I thought you'd never ask. (laughs) (laughs) Genuinely my favorite thing in the world right now. Uh, And I love talking about it too. So Elegant Goth Lolita started in Japan in the late 70s, early 80s as a means of expressing femininity without sexualization. Mm. So defeating the male gaze, essentially. And it is very much inspired by Rococo and Victorian fashions. Mm. And it has a very signature shape. So all of the dresses that you see have this sort of like bell shape in the skirt. Mm. And it's also very modest. Um, As I said, it's all about defeating the male gaze and being effeminate and yourself and all of these other things, right? It's it's very, very feminist end of Mm -hmm. the day. I love it. It's becoming feminine to the point of grotesqueness. Mm. Yes. And uh, it's just so much fun. Uh, My partner, Joseph Noop, he bought me my first dress this last Christmas. Yes, along with my wonderful crystal star brooch from Sailor Moon uh, that there are lots of videos of online me crying. (laughs) (laughs) As you receive it, like tears of joy, hopefully. (laughs) Yes. Um, 13,000 people have seen that video. Oh, (laughs) (laughs) and uh yeah i just i really love it the aesthetic is very whatever you want it to be right Mm. um i am a sweet lolita so i wear a lot of like pastel colors and dresses with food and sweets and animals and things Mm. like that and it's all very pink and yellow and purple and blue but there's also classic lolita which is very Victorian inspired A line sort of silhouettes. And mm. there's also Gothic Lolita, which is, as the name sounds, Gothic. It's <laughs> black and very aristocratic and just gorgeous in its own right. And I I am just ridiculous and campy. Oh my gosh, I love that. <laughs> How do you feel when you're dressed up in all of your regalia? Oh, so good. <laughs> so good. <laughs> I I love the way that Lilina makes me feel, right? Mm. I love that it's so much more about the appreciation of fashion and designers uh, because it is very niche, mm. right? You know, as I said, it started in Japan. It's an alternative fashion. And of course, there are people who assume the name Lolita is associated with the book, which is really fucked mm. up. Uh, no, it's not. It just has the same name. There's really no correlation. Mm-hmm. Um, and there are a lot of people who just associate it with peddling to pedophilia and mm-hmm. to like, well, why are you dressing up like a child? You know, it's just, it's very disappointing to me that in our society globally, that femininity is too childish for adult women and feminine people to present as, you know, I love cute things and I love to wear cute clothes. That's literally it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Absolutely. And I, you know, um, of course there's no one way to be non-binary and there's also exactly. no one way to be femme. And as a fellow non-binary person, I'm wondering if you could speak to like, I got something that you mentioned was um, how it's an expression of femininity that feels so fun um, and it's it's like over the top, uh, grotesque was a word you used, yes. um, and also modest. And for me, as someone who's found that expressing my own femininity has become, has felt so much better and also been a lot easier after starting hormones, coming mm-hmm. out as trans, masculine, and just under, understanding myself more. Like, I, I feel like my relationship to femininity has changed. It's a lot healthier now than it was mm-hmm. before I understood myself. And so I was just wondering, like, how do you kind of think about the intersection between your interest in in Lolita and, and your identity as non-binary? Totally. Um, so I actually identify as genderqueer. 
Mm. Um, rather Sorry than non-binary. For assuming no, it's there. totally okay. No, <laughs> you're totally fine because like I fall under the same umbrella. Um, you know, for me, and this is total bullshit. Um, I feel <laughs> like I am too femme to mm. consider myself non-binary. Mm. But like you said, like there's no one way to present and identify with non-binary. Absolutely. Right? There's not. It's just my brain can't wrap that around mm-hmm. for myself. Mm-hmm. That's and why gender- we have so many words. Exactly. <laughs> and just gender queer. Word feels good. Yeah. Right. <laughs> gender queer is the word that has worked the best for me. Mm-hmm. Um, and ultimately, I, I just I lovingly call my gender chaos. Mm. <laughs> love that um and you know just like you like i feel embracing this part of myself has absolutely changed my feelings about femininity and expressing in a feminine way mm. um i feel like so much of it before was like okay well i have to be a certain shape and a certain size and there's something wrong with me because i have torian angles mm-hmm. you know Kinkles, but I call them Tori Kinkles. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, I feel like being part of the Lolita fashion community has one brought me in touch with so many amazing people, mm. but also with the queer community here in the area. It's been so difficult for me to meet other queer people, which is hysterical because I live in San Francisco. (laughs) Right, right. It's like the gayest city in this fucking country. (laughs) (laughs) But like, for some reason, it's just been so hard for me to be able to connect with other queer people Mm. here, especially. And uh, Lolita is so fucking sapphic. (laughs) Mm -hmm. It really is. Mm -hmm. And it's delightful. Like, there is not a straight person among us. (laughs) That sounds positively fantastical. (laughs) Exactly. And there's so many people who are trans and non-binary and genderqueer. And just we're all kind of chaotic Mm -hmm. in our own ways. But this is the thing that connects us. And it's beautiful and wonderful. And... I love how indulgent it is. Awesome. That's incredible. And Aiden, something else that you do is work at Ubisoft as a yes! creator relations <laughs> PR specialist and yes. Um, Can you tell us more about that job? What do all those words mean? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, first off, um, I work with influencers and creators, uh, and it's not where I expect it to be. Ooh, say more. (laughs) (laughs) So uh, I started my career when I was 18 Mm -hmm. uh, as a journalist. And I was working in local news. I worked for a little teeny tiny site called Naples Herald for a really long time. I was the only person in Naples, Florida, actually doing games reporting. Wow. (laughs) Yeah. I won an award for it, too. It was very sweet. (laughs) Um, But I brought in a lot of traffic for them. Mm. And my boss and I were like a hell of a power team. His name is Robbie. He's great. I still absolutely adore him. Aww. And not just saying that to be nice. I genuinely do. <laughs> um, but stayed there for a really long time. Got picked up by GameSpot as a weekend editor for a while. Uh, did my internship at Paste Magazine in their games section. And then I got picked up by IGN to do stuff for Snapchat. Mm. Uh, and then that kind of snowballed into everything else. And quite honestly, it's easier to tell you what I didn't do at IGN than what I did do. Uh, and that's be permanent staff. Oh. <laughs> Not for lack of trying. Mm. Um, so freelance with IGN for about five years and worked with Polygon and Kotaku and all of these different places. Mm-hmm. And it was a blast. It really was. Unfortunately, with the landscape changing uh, mm-hmm. in the pandemic, there just really wasn't a place for me in games journalism financially anymore. Because mm-hmm. um, when you're a freelancer, you're an entrepreneur. You know, you are your everything and you have to really sell yourself. And unfortunately, being a queer person and a feminine person, Mm -hmm. there were definitely issues at some publications where they did not want to work with me because Mm. of the way that I present. And um, yeah, it really, really sucked. It was Mm -hmm. not great. And I have some not awesome stories Mm. about particular editors. Um, Mm. And it makes me sad that I have those stories. I don't wish that upon anybody. Um, But in my postgraduate job dance over the last year and a half uh, from Berkeley, Mm. got my master's, which is really, (laughs) really weird to say. I mm, (laughs) makes me feel very old. (laughs) Yeah, very, uh, they're a master. I mean, it's 
It's a title. <laughs> it is. It really is. And I, I don't know if I would call myself a master of journalism. I'm pretty damn good. But. <laughs> right. It's that old saying, like, the, the more experience you have, the more you realize how much you don't know. Exactly. Mm. Uh, that's a really good way of putting it. <laughs> but, um, yeah, my weird job dance. I, I started interviewing with UB. In January of this year, actually, mm. um, I had gotten my first call from a recruiter saying that I got an interview and my dad had been back and forth at the hospital, mm. just not doing too hot. And um, actually ended up being the last conversation we had when I told him mm. that I had gotten the interview. Right. Oh. Yeah. It's, it's very sentimental. We'll get emotional here. <laughs> get you some good bites. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but um. Anyway, um, told him I got the job. I was like, Dad, you know, I got an interview with Yubi. And he's like, fuck yeah, you did. Um, and got to the final rounds. Uh, I was with the Yubi News team. The role ended up going to Chastity, um, which mm. she is fabulous. Uh, absolutely deserves that position. And I don't hold a candle to that woman. I uh, <laughs> worked with her a bit at GameSpot, actually. Mm. And she is just incredible in every way. Um, it was definitely a bummer. Because I showed up to the final round of interviews literally days after my dad passed. Wow. Yeah. Um, almost rescheduled. And I decided not to because I was so scared of losing my chance. Mm-hmm. And um, which is really sad. Like nobody should have to be right. that afraid of yeah. losing an opportunity when Absolutely. your whole world crashes down. Right. Mm-hmm. And um, showed up anyway. And um that round didn't end up working out, which Mm. was okay. You know, I definitely was not meant to have that position and that's okay. Mm -hmm. Um, A few months down the road, um, the recruiter hit me up again and said, Hey, we have this opportunity with influencers for you. You Mm. know, it's, it's contract, but it might be interesting to you. Do you want to go forward? I was like, sure. Why not? And um, ended up obviously getting the job, which is great. (laughs) Uh, And the gamble that I took in one of the final rounds was the best show of character I can give you is that this happened to me. My dad died, you know, and I still showed up anyway and I Mm. didn't let any of you see it because Mm. I was so determined to get through and to impress you and to show you that I'm worth hiring. Right. Mm -hmm. And, um, Got the job. <laughs> so that was that was a good gamble. <laughs> yeah, like you said, absolutely. We should be striving. F- and I think we're starting to see that that push, that shift in sort of, you know, how do we find space for humanity in the working yeah. world and especially in a totally remote working world? And, exactly. and how can we be an industry that celebrates so much creativity, but then the way it's set up and, and how games are built is sort of squeezes all life and creativity out of you like yeah right uh, there's something's got to give and so i commend you uh for that achievement um, thank you and i'm so happy for you and I totally agree with you that you should not have had to do that <laughs> of course not and it's actually it is very sad there was another interview that i had had for a totally different thing outside of games mm-hmm. and i had mentioned they're like when can you start and it was like well anytime you want me to but you know, I would appreciate at least having a week. My dad literally just died yesterday. Mm-hmm. And they were like, oh, and told me I didn't get the job. Uh, <laughs> wow. Yeah, it was hey, that's a bullet dodged. Yes, truly. <laughs> truly. Um, anyway, what I do on the team, um, so I handle all of our influencers for certain titles. Um, mm. The title that I worked on most recently was Far Cry 6. Mm. Uh, so I helped determine like who got to go to our preview events and doing all the tracking and all of the data collection and outreach to creators. Uh, and it's pretty much what I do. It's great. I also get to send things to people and nice. make their day and also ruin their day by telling them you are not getting shit. It's great. Yeah. It's great. I love it. What excites you about this role and, and working with creators? Um, everything. <laughs> it really was shocking to me that I I love it so much. I mm. genuinely didn't think that I was going to connect with it as much as I have. Um, I genuinely thought this was just going to be a job. 
Mm. You know, I was really like my wheelhouse is multimedia. It's journalism, right? Because that's what I've done for the last eight years of my life. Mm -hmm. And um, this is just so different. And I love how grateful and kind and warm people are. I love being able to find new talent and people who haven't had a chance to be supported Mm -hmm. like larger influencers have. I love being able to offer opportunities and help people get discovered. Mm -hmm. Um, One of the people that I actually scouted for this last round, he made a TikTok that had seven and a half million views within 48 hours. Wow. Yeah. And nothing had popped off like that for him mm. before, which was which is wild to me because he has really good content, honestly. And also, I know how to pick him. I'm a Taurus. <laughs> 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 but like seeing people be so successful and so pleased and proud because of the one tiny thing that we did for them mm. it means the world to me. Mm-hmm. I love that. I love being able to support people. And that's what I loved about being an editor, too, was being able to give people a platform and a foundation to spring forth from, mm-hmm. right? It's just, that's what excites me. And mm-hmm. I love the people. I love what I'm doing. And everything about it just makes me come alive. You know, you mentioned that you are also a writer and an editor. Um, yes. Something that stood out to me from your bio is how um, something you're known for is your impossibly optimistic attitude um, and your desire to cover tough topics like trauma, gender and sexuality, and societal issues within your niche in an empathetic way. And I'm wondering, what do you think it is about video games that can help facilitate conversations about tough topics? Oh, so much. Absolutely. Everything about them. Uh, the community would say otherwise, but. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, yeah. Some vocal people within the community would say otherwise, but they're wrong. <laughs> yes. Very wrong. <laughs> and they should feel wrong. Yes, I agree. <laughs> um, I feel, especially just in the experiences that I've had in the games industry over the years and being involved in so many smaller communities and especially underrepresented communities. Mm-hmm. I feel the interactive nature of video games allows people to live a life they wouldn't normally experience. You know, and there's so many games that really do that for you. They bring up so much emotion. Mm -hmm. Um, Like the worst emotion I felt recently in a video game is uh, Last of Us 2 and Killing the Dog. Yeah. Uh, I hate that shit. Mm -hmm. Not okay. Mm -hmm. Um, But that's one of those instances where it makes you uncomfortable to tell a story. It's a narrative reason. A shitty narrative reason, but narrative reason. Mm-hmm. And um, I feel for so many people when they really connect with you with a game of any sort, honestly, it just opens a door to something they wouldn't normally have access to. Mm-hmm. I believe that video games bring so much accessibility to certain topics and also are very gatekeepy at times. But for the most part, it is a soul that's on fire. I think, Mm -hmm. and brings a level of magic and wonder. So hmm. I'm not sure what words I'm looking for here. I think games are great. (laughs) (laughs) Just put a button in it. (laughs) That works. (laughs) Video games are good, actually. Yeah. (laughs) Video games are good, people. End of episode. We like video games, too. (laughs) Oh, my God. No way. (laughs) It's true. You mentioned The Last of Us 2. And I think, um, first of all, yes, the way that they build up a sort of you know, secondary character sort of relationship with that dog. And then your perspective is, is switched and suddenly that happens. Um, Mm -hmm. uh, But the way that that game, I think I was struck by, I mean, I, I have to admit, I could not finish the last 10% of the game. It became too much for me, and I had to put it, it down. It is a lot. It's a lot. As a trauma survivor, as I, like, as a lot of things, <laughs> I haven't experienced a zombie apocalypse yet, but I just, I had to put it down, and I had to watch the last <laughs> couple hours. Um, but the way that it was able to so completely change my worldview um you know 
for folks, uh, I spoilers for the last of us part two, um, <laughs> slight spoilers, but you know, you play the first half of the game as Ellie and then you play, or uh, and you play the second half of the game as Abby. Um, and the experience of like Abby does something to Ellie in the very beginning of the game that, uh, is absolutely unforgivable to Ellie. Yeah. And as, Plus, some people who have played the first game, if you play the first game, like Ellie is someone who, um, you know, is the he cast as the hero. She's the protagonist of the story. Um, you want to root for her. You identify with her. And as far as you're concerned, she's absolutely justified in her uh, mission for revenge. Um, and you embark upon that for several hours alongside her. And I feel like you maybe start to pick up on that this anger she's holding and how she's going about it is maybe a little unhealthy. But because you trust her and know her and love her, I think it's hard at first to sort of you know as the player step back and say like hmm maybe we shouldn't be doing this one of the things i appreciate about the last of us too is the way it reminds you that you're playing the game but you are a guest in the space this isn't your story to tell and these characters have their own decisions to make and you are simply a witness um but what the game does by putting you in Abby's shoes is, I mean, I remember when I first realized that I was going to have to play the game as Abby and I almost put the controller down because I was, I hated her so much that mm -hmm. I could not, I could not forgive the game for making me play as her. And I think that's something that a lot of people felt. Um, but I think that for those of us who were able to work through that hate and actually give the narrative and give Abby a chance to show themselves to us. I'm not saying by the end of the game that I completely agree with all of Abby's decisions or that she's even a good person, but I think I feel about her a lot of the similar ways that I feel about Joel in that she's a complicated, violent individual who's mm -hmm. had to live a life where there were very little choice, like very little circumstances that would set her up to make different choices. So just the way that that game so radically shifted my perspective from hate to the point of almost putting down the controller to actually crying for her, feeling for her, wanting her to survive was one of the most beautiful and jarring and traumatic gaming experiences in recent memory. And I think it just absolutely falls in with what you're saying about what games have the capacity to do. Exactly. You know, and that's a wonderful example of a video game just really breaking down what trauma actually is mm. there's so many video games and movies and shows and things that really want to talk about trauma but they don't do it in a good way mm -hmm. you know it feels defeating it feels superficial maybe that's the word i'm looking for here um and they just don't go deep enough but i feel like last of us too especially just <sighs> sinks the knife in slowly mm. for you to understand enough of, wow, this existence is tortured. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I mean, as somebody who has complex PTSD, I feel like there are so many people who don't get what the living with PTSD is like mm -hmm. until they live with it too. Yes. And I'm a survivor myself, unfortunately. That's not a secret. That's the thing that's been known for a while. Um, but um, that's one of the things that I really was striving to portray in my journalism was empathetic and kind and respectful covering mm -hmm. of trauma in general, but also gender-based violence. That was a big part of what I did in undergrad um, and trauma-informed reporting. And there are so many journalists out there. God bless them. They really want to do the right thing. <laughs> they want to tell these stories and give people that platform and foundation. But the systems in place are not productive. Maybe mm -hmm. that's the right word. They're very skewed against survivors and also skewed against the journalists. Like we are very much the last line of defense that most survivors have. And there's no support for us, mm -hmm. you know, not in our work, not in medical care. It just, it doesn't exist, you mm -hmm. know? And when we don't have resources for ourselves, how are we able to give resources to other people? Mm -hmm. Right. Especially when it comes to trauma informed reporting, you are very vividly 
reliving and telling these stories of trauma, it's hard. Mm-hmm. It's really hard. Um, my senior year of undergrad, my thesis was on gender-based violence in our community. And we dug through 10 years worth of records um, on reported assaults and domestic violence and things like that is, is a very intense thesis. Mm. Um, but it was, I want to call it rewarding, but I can't. Mm-hmm. No, I mean, something you've said that really resonates was um, I, I got my start doing arts and culture coverage in the Boston area for a local NPR station. And I, my beat was sort of um, queer and trans folks, um, typically folks of color who were using art, music, theater, um, you know, performance, painting to transmute uh, the oppressive marginalization that they had faced into sources of power, sources of energy for the community. And you're absolutely right. Uh, as uh, someone living with CPTSD myself, it witnessing all of that is work. Witnessing it and translating it into something that like, how do you hold all of the complex emotion and generational trauma and lived experience into 800 words or 1200 exactly. words? It's, it's so taxing. And, and like you said, the people around me were white cis men. I knew that they weren't going to write about folks, about my folks with the, with the care and the empathy and the competence that I would. And so exactly. there was a pressure too of like, if I stop, who will pick this up? Who will be there? Who, you know, who's going to protect these people? Mm. And it's like, you know, I don't necessarily even see myself as in a position where they ne- even need my protection. But I absolutely like, yes, what you're saying completely resonates in that, like, who is there in solidarity with them? Who is, you know, who's witnessing it fully and not casting their own gaze, translating it through their own gaze? Right. And maybe protect wasn't the right word there, but who's going to serve those people? Mm hmm. Mm-hmm. Like that's that's a big thing for me. I started journalism as a public service. That's what I was trained to be. Mm-hmm. That's what I was trained to do, and I loved it. Like, that's why I continue to do it. It's a mission that I strive to do, right? To serve others, mm-hmm. and not because like I'm a people pleaser, but because my heart is generally driven to do that. And <sighs> the worst part of it all is that. These discussions don't happen in the classroom. They don't happen in the newsroom. Nobody's Mm -hmm. being formally trained for any of this. I was the first person at Berkeley, of all fucking places, to talk about trauma-informed reporting. Wow. Mm. Yeah. Like, how? How? (laughs) (laughs) I just don't understand. And, like, we were constantly being forced into conversations about gender-based violence and whatnot Mm. and i would always have to step out of the room it was just too fucking Mm -hmm. much you know we weren't having those conversations consensually Mm -hmm. we weren't given being given content warnings and trigger warnings and the space to leave if we needed to absolutely you know and that was just wild to me because here's all these people in this ridiculously liberal city Mm -hmm. right who are very driven and ambitious and they care a lot, Mm -hmm. but they don't know how to talk about trauma. Because to them, it's a special interest and not a lived experience that they truly can associate with. Mm -hmm. Exactly. You know, and it just, oh my God, it sucks. (laughs) (laughs) Like, it sucks for a grad school perspective because grad school is a mistake. Mm -hmm. (laughs) But... (laughs) It's true. Grad school is fucking awful. Uh, (laughs) But like here I thought I was going to be in this space that like Mm -hmm. people intentionally thought about all of this and they just don't. Mm -hmm. They just don't. And I was the first person there to really create that space. Wow. Yeah. I mean, because I was so at the time being debilitated by my PTSD you know, it was before I was able to get really wonderful care for it. You know, I was a point where I had called 10 different practices to mm. get care and every single one of them turned me away. 
Because you're non-binary? Because I've had that no, experience. I have not had that experience, thank God. <laughs> it was because they genuinely couldn't help me. Mm. They didn't have resources to care for PTSD. Mm. Which is Ugh. crazy to think about. Like, wow, how do you yes. not, as a therapy practice, know how to deal with PTSD? Mm-hmm. <laughs> but, like, every single one of them had to turn me away. And for somebody who... Genuine, genuinely needs therapy as a means of medical care for a long period of time. Like I've been in therapy for eight years now. <laughs> I've made a lot of progress, but the place that finally took me um, was the Bay Area Trauma Recovery Clinic. Mm. They have changed my life. Mm-hmm. Mm absolutely changed my life. It's a practice that's run by students in the area. They're obviously supervised, but they're in the process of getting their degrees and licenses to be therapists, right? Um, And so there's only a certain time of the year that you're able to access that care. It's through the school year. um, And it's a new person every year because they're students. But just in the time that I've been with them over the last four years, my life is drastically different. Mm -hmm. They've, they've just changed my life in the best of ways. Um, it's taught me skills that I never learned growing mm. up. It's helped me understand more about myself and about what I went through, both just personally and in my career doing trauma-informed work. Um, it's It's been helping me relearn how to live a life that's not constantly in danger, Right. Yes. Because that's the way my brain developed into adulthood, was constantly being in danger. And there's so much that I realize these days that I'm just absolutely heartbroken by, and I'm angry, and I'm hurt, and I'm finally able to feel that way. Mm-hmm. You know, Whereas in the past, I, one, couldn't physically remember it, mm-hmm. <laughs> because it was that repressed, but also two identified so closely with the people who harmed me that I excused and enabled their behavior. Mm -hmm. And now being on the other side, I'm finally able to be like, yeah, this was fucked up. Yeah. I I think a lot of what you're saying resonates. I it's, it's nice to have this conversation because I don't know that I have been able to have a conversation with another Gender queer, um, you know, CPTSD survivor. Um, I, you know, I've spent the past seven years trying to find a therapist to help me understand why I'm going to therapy every week, and I still mm-hmm. am so afraid. I still wake up, my chest tight. I can't sleep. Yes. I can't eat. Something's yes. there, and I can't see it. Something's looking at me in the dark and following me, and I can't. I don't understand it. I've been so long trying to distract myself from it with alcohol, with weed, with TV, with games at some points, and and I need to face it. And that's something that I didn't know until I found a therapist who sees me. Um, I've been seeing her for the past couple months, and already in these two months with her, I've made so much progress in just, you know, looking inward and reaching out towards the parts of me that are still hurting and scared and in pain and having no one to teach them, to guide them, to validate them and learning, you know, to accept that that happened, but also that as an adult now, I have the power to keep myself safe and to nurture those parts of me that never received the love that they deserved. And I think to bring it back to games, I think so much of games focuses on you know, winning the battle is the end of the work. Surviving is the end of the work. And what I'm learning so often is that that's where the work begins. That's what I'm learning now is that's where the work begins is, is the aftermath. The, mm-hmm. Who's there to pick up the pieces when the battle is won? Who's there to learn how to, you know, teach you how to be a person again? Um, that right. person's got to be you, unfortunately. And <laughs> no one gave us the skills to to learn that. And so... Yeah, I'm just I'm just grateful to have this space to talk to you about it. I'm grateful too, for the record. Thank you so much. <laughs> it really it does genuinely mean the world to me because so often you don't find people who Mm-mm. innately understand your experience. Mm-hmm. You know, one thing that I really love and that has completely shifted everything for me was actually a meditation I did a few years ago. Mm. Um 
I did a lot of holistic therapy before I came to California. It's all they would give me. It's ridiculous. Uh, on medication now, and it is the best thing that's ever happened to me. <laughs> uh, I love my silly little brain pills. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but the meditation had a line of consider the possibility of choice. Mm. And maybe that's why games resonate so much with me because so many of them are about choice Mm -hmm. and agency that I was never provided uh, Mm. for the majority of my life. And it's a line that I love to use just in the context of games, of course, but also just in my life in general. It's been a constant battle of allowing myself permission Mm -hmm. and considering that possibility, right? Well, what what if I did have a choice here? What if I could do this? What would what would the result be? And um, it's helped a lot. Mm, it's beautiful. on this show is we love to talk to folks about games that have had an impact on their life in a meaningful way. Um, You mentioned to us the Project Diva series and specifically Hatsune Miku. Um, For folks who may not be familiar with Project Diva and the whole Vocaloid-like phenomenon, could you sort of break it down in a couple sentences? (laughs) A couple sentences. Try. (laughs) (laughs) A few sentences. Yes. (laughs) So Hatsune Miku is not a person. Uh, She quote unquote, uh, is a virtual pop star. She is a voice synthesizer. So her programming is just a voice bank and you can tune it to whatever you like and you can make music with it. It's very cool. Um, and I have been into Hatsune Miku since her release in, I want to say 2007. Yeah, it's been like 14 years. Let me see. I think it was August 31st, 2007. <laughs> <laughs> Where were you on August 31st, 2007? And what happened? Nixon, Missouri. That's where I was. <laughs> it was the I think that got me. I think it was August 31st, 2007. Anyway, yes, I was right. Great. Go ahead. Wow. Uh, get your hug. <laughs> but um, anyway, Miku is an idea, mm-hmm. right? And a cl- a collective idea. She can be anything you want her to be. And it was really the Japanese community, of course, because Miku herself is a Japanese program, um, which now has multiple languages, uh, which is super cool. Her English voice bank is really cute, and I adore it uh, because the accent is so strong. It's amazing. Um, but you're allowed to take this like collective image of her, which is the blue pigtails and the youthful energy and all of that. Right. And transform her into whatever Mm. you want her to be. Like there can never be an idol controversy with her because she's not Mm. a real person. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Right. She can't theoretically do anything wrong. Mm. Right. She can't be a home wrecker or, (laughs) get addicted to anything like she is just she's an existence right and i think that's what i love about her the most is that like in my mind she is exactly what i want her to be but also Mm. to the person next to me she's exactly what they want her to be and i think that's just the coolest thing in the world um i love mika so much i have her tattooed on my body (laughs) Uh (laughs) yes um i'm gonna show you guys here i can show you in the zoom call real quick nice she is on my bicep Nice. And give us okay, paint cool. us a word picture for the folks at home. Yes. So Miku on her left shoulder, her bicep, like mine, uh, she has a giant red zero one. Mm. And I was going to get that. Um, instead, my artist came back with this, which is the zero one. And it has her face just kind of Ooh. looking. It's her eyes. Mm. Uh, the big anime girl eye is just very bright in her hair. There's her headphones over here, too. It's just absolutely gorgeous. And I think my favorite part is 
her flesh tone bits. You can mm. actually see my freckles through. So it looks <laughs> like she has freckles. Aw, that's a good artist. Someone who takes yes. your concept and then brings it even further to fruition. He was really incredible. I was one of the last people that he tattooed. His name was Brian Headley at Hal Fort Myers. Mm. He passed away probably about six months after mm. he did this tattoo on me, which is very sad. I went to his memorial at the studio and everything. And mm. yeah, it's one of those things that like is very special to me. And like, not just because of what it means to me. I got this done on her 10th anniversary. Mm. My best friend, uh, Mike, he got his done the same day, but he was in Japan for the magical Mirai concerts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And his is just red. Um, but my artist came back with this and I had to have it. And it's like one of the most special, meaningful mm. pieces to me. Um, I also have Sailor Moon's Moonstick on my thigh. As one got to. <laughs> exactly. Got to. <laughs> yes, that was my my breakup tattoo. <laughs> <laughs> I had been engaged mm. uh, and was moving to California. And I was like, fuck it. I'm going to go do this piece because it mm. means a lot to me. And I want it done finally. Yeah, it's a big shift. It's exactly. something to commemorate and remind exactly. you of your own, you know, capacity for resilience. I don't know. I love that. <laughs> me too. And then I also have a chess piece. Mm. It is a sunflower and mm. it, the stem is in calligraphy and it says adamantine. Do you know what mm. that means? No. So this is really dumb and nerdy. Um, it is partially inspired by the Animantis in Final mm. Fantasy. <laughs> oh. So um, Adamantine is also the metal that's in Adamantium, rather, mm. I should say. Uh, the metal that's in um, the guy with the claws. Wolverine. Yes, thank you. <laughs> oh, yeah, that guy. <laughs> <laughs> the guy with the claws. I saw Logan. I'm there. <laughs> thank you. Um, <laughs> uh, anyway, something that is adamant, right, is unrelenting. Mm. It is going to go for it. It's going to do all these things. So something in theory that is adamantine is a quality. It's unbreakable. Mm -hmm. um, and the reason why I have it on my left side of my chest under my collarbone is that one, it's always close, but also above my heart because it's a celebration of who I am and what I've endured, but also just really pretty and delightful and a wonderful message to have to heart. And it's mm -hmm. a sunflower because of my best friend who saved my life actually. So oh. that one is a really special piece. All of them are very special pieces, <laughs> but, and I love tattoos. I, I need 5,000 more. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Always. Uh, yes. I'm um, going to get a good job, Aiden, on my wrist at some point. Yeah. You got to have those <laughs> daily affirmations. Exactly. <laughs> now, I'd love it if you could close this out with um, a story. You mentioned you have a lot of very cute oh, and silly God. stories about Project Diva and about yes. Miku. What's a story that will kind of capture the essential essence of why you love these games? Oh, God. Mm. Mm, to narrow it just down to one. <laughs> um, I have every single copy of the game imported from Japan. Wow. Yeah. And there's like six, I want to say. And they're just rhythm games. They're rhythm games of the, the music that's been produced with Vocaloids. So it has all the characters and all of the influences and everything. And it's just, it's a rhythm game, right? Like Guitar Hero, but on steroids. Mm. <laughs> it's very <laughs> difficult to play, actually. Um, but I was 14 years old and I had asked my dad, I want a PSP for my birthday and I want to buy this game and here's how we do it. <laughs> and he's like, man, this is really expensive. I was like, I don't care. <laughs> this is what I want to play. <laughs> and I would bring my PSP with me to every single finals. Uh, Cause in our high school, if you had missed less than two days and you had above all C's in all your classes, you didn't have to take any finals. Oh, dang. Above yeah. C's. Wow. That's a pretty reasonable bar. <laughs> mm -hmm. It really was. And I mean, the attendance thing was a little bit bullshit, but uh, yeah, you know, you're making decent grades. You don't need to worry about it. Right. And I would always do that. And the entire time, since I didn't have to take any finals, was just play Project Diva mm. over and over and over again. And one of my songs that I had to do on hard, because <laughs> hard was only in the first original PSP games uh, that were never released outside of Japan. Oh, wow. Um, it was the Forte series that was um, on Vita. Mm. Um, but 
one song and I I literally cried the second I finally did it. I played it on perfect completely unintentionally <laughs> and it was meltdown. Is yeah. that a hard one? Yes, it is <laughs> extremely unpleasant. <laughs> we'll put it that way. Um, there's also another song. It's called The Disappearance of Hatsune Miku. Um, mm. And I, oh God, for the life of me, I could play through half of the song completely perfectly. And then the end of the song is just like 16 notes. Oh God. Just over and over and over and over and over for like a solid minute. <laughs> just bashing at that point yeah it was bad (laughs) i played that song 104 times before i could beat it 80 step aside (laughs) (laughs) truly truly but uh these games are so special to me because they're a part of my life where i finally discovered something that could really get me through right Mm. that i could rely on at all times and that was entirely my own right None of my friends understood it. I didn't give a shit. My my parents didn't understand it. I didn't give a shit. You know, it was just something that was uniquely and divinely mine. Mm. And uh, the music's also really fucking good. (laughs) (laughs) I still listen to it. Um, I saw the live stream Miku concert this Mm. year. I was supposed to go to Miku Expo here in California. Mm. um, That was obviously put off because of covid and this year was the first year that it was all music that I didn't know. Oh, wow. Yeah. Every other year, I've known every single song. And it's just so cool how the generation after mine has taken Vocaloid. TikTokers like to admit to Vocaloid phases. It's not a fucking phase for me. Mm. <laughs> but um, it's so cool how they've taken Vocaloid and the idea of Vocaloid and Miku and all of the other characters and evolved it. Mm. You know? Like, it's it's just such an interesting connection to, I think to what musicians are capable of and who they really are because end of the day every expression of Hatsune Miku is unique to that person you know she's not one particular thing to anyone as I was saying before yeah she's just an existence and she can be whatever the hell you want her to be that's awesome and that's what she was for me it's beautiful Aiden, thank you so much for joining us on Pixel Therapy. It's been an absolute pleasure getting to know you a little bit. Thank you. This has been an absolute blast. And I am so grateful for your space and your time and your energy. It's been a delight. Time is up for today's session of Pixel Therapy. Thank you for tuning in. And we hope that listening to our thoughts and feelings gave you some thoughts and feelings of your own. If you want more Pixel Therapy, come check us out at patreon.com slash pixeltherapypod where you can snag that monthly bonus episode for just $2 a month, plus opportunities to get involved with the community and influence the show directly. If you're not up for contributing monetarily, but you enjoyed this episode, you can show your support for free by rating and reviewing us on Apple Podcasts and following us on Twitter and Instagram at pixeltherapypod. That stuff is just as important and we appreciate it just as much. Remember that Pixel Therapy is a happy member of the But Why Though Podcast Network, so you can support us by supporting them and heading over to butwhythoughpodcast.com. That's though with a T-H-O. Take a peek at the inclusive geek community they're building around pop culture news, reviews, and kick-ass podcasts like yours truly. And you can keep up with all of this stuff and more by visiting our website at pixeltherapypod.com. Finally, since we like to put our money and our energy where our mouth is, we end every episode with a recommended side quest. Thank you so much to Aiden for recommending one of our favorite content creation sites um, and the home of one of uh, our past Pixel Therapy alum alumnuses, alumni, <laughs> uh, the incredible Courtney Craven. Um, but anyway, today's side quest is Can I Play That? Dot com. It is a destination for players and developers alike, providing all forms of accessibility information on video games and the industry. Reviews, news stories, and features at Can I Play That exclusively report on the ever-growing presence and adoption of accessibility features within the gaming industry. Their work has been read and shared internally at studios around the world, such as Xbox, PlayStation, Ubisoft, Square Enix, and countless others, with support from Xbox and PlayStation executives. Phil Spencer, and Herman Hulst. Can I Play That works to share stories that influence game updates, inform disabled players, educate and entertain players and developers, 
and provide a voice for one of the largest player bases in the industry. Um, please check them out at caniplaythat.com. Um, you know, show them some support and maybe even submit an article idea of your own. Thank you for that side quest, Spencer. That is our show for today. So go forth, run a story mission, level up some stats, and don't forget to hug an NPC every now and then. We'll be back soon with some more Pixel, Pixel Therapy. therapy. Yeah. <laughs> bye bye. <laughs>